My favorite way to beat inflation and fill my prepper pantry at the same time. Hey guys, it's Jarrah with Wicked Prepared. Welcome back to the channel, everyone. If it's your first time here, we are glad you're here and we hope you'll hit that subscribe button and stay a while. Our channel is all about, you guessed it, preparedness. We try to cover all our bases and help you do the same. We believe if you prepare for the big stuff, you'll be ready for all the little stuff that comes along as well. Today I'm adding a bit more to our prepper pantry and saving some money while I'm doing it. With food prices rising like they have been and the threat of food scarcity hanging over our heads, one of the best things we can do is to stock up at the lowest price possible and buy enough at that price to last until we see those low prices again. Whether it be sales, clearance prices, coupons, rebate apps, or any combination of those things, I'm always on the lookout for lower prices so I can stock up for tomorrow or next week or even next year and beyond at today's prices. Stocking up is fairly easy when we're talking about our canned goods and our dry goods, but it gets a little more challenging when it comes to fresh foods like meats and produce. What many do is toss these things in the freezer, but that can be problematic when you're talking about emergency food storage. When a situation arises that we need our emergency food for, there's a good chance the power grid will be down. At that point, your freezer and everything inside of it is pretty much worthless. Even if you have a generator and stored fuel, that only lasts so long. Even if we don't find ourselves in a grid down emergency, how many of us have lost a freezer full of food because the freezer died or a child accidentally left the freezer door open and then all of those cost savings have gone out the door and then some. So we've turned more towards other means of preserving food, ways that make it shelf stable so it will still be there for us when the grid goes down. Things like canning, dehydrating, and freeze drying. Today, I'm gonna take you along and show you what I did when I got some really good deals on some Italian sausage, bell peppers, and mushrooms. Just a little prep work, and these will be shelf stable for many, many years. Let's get to work. All right, so I'm gonna start by cooking up the sausage. Now, I've got this sausage here. I picked this up when it was on clearance. I got six packages. I got all that they had at that price. They did have some of the same sausage priced higher, um, even on clearance. I don't know why that was, but, but I got the six packages. So what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm gonna do half uh, as whole sausages and then slice them up and then I'm gonna do half, I'm gonna open up the casings and um, cook the sausage like a ground meat. So that way I can try them both ways and see which we like better. So I'm just gonna put these um, first three packages, so the first three pounds of sausages on this baking sheet. I'm gonna bake these in the oven until they're fully cooked and then I'll slice them up. While these sausages are cooking, I'll get the other sausages ready to um, brown up on the stove top. All right, so this pan is ready to go in the oven. Like I said, I have the oven set um, at 400 degrees. So I'm just gonna let these go until they're done. I don't know how long that'll be. I never usually time this kind of stuff. I just put it until it looks good. And sometimes I use my meat thermometer just to make sure. So I'll bring you back in just a minute when I'm ready to get the other sausages um, prepared. So what I'm gonna do with this next batch of sausage is I'm just gonna open up the casings and take out um, the meat that's inside so that I can scramble them up on the on the stove top kind of like ground beef. Just like um, like bulk sausage instead of links. So I just slit the um, casing with my knife and then as I'm cooking this on the stove I'll just use my meat masher uh, to mash them up and they'll grind up very well. All right so here is the three pounds of sausage that I'm going to grind up and cook that way. I probably should have picked a bigger pot, but we're gonna go with it and hopefully it won't overflow. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna get this burner turned on and I'm just gonna scramble this up with my meat masher and get this sausage all cooked up. It's starting to sizzle. Now I don't usually add any oil when I do this because there's plenty of fat in these sausages that is gonna come out. And this pan right here is a ceramic coated pan that we got from Walmart and we really like it. It seems to be um, really pretty nonstick without having that nonstick coating that's really not good for people. And as this sausage gets um, heats up, it's gonna get softer and easier to mash. I really should wait before I start mashing it, but I'm always impatient. <laughs> Now I really should have used a bigger pan for this. It does fit when it's just sitting still, but when I'm trying to mash, I'm having a hard time losing it out the sides of the pan, but 
it is what it is. We're just going to carry on. All right, so this is definitely cooked and it's about as mashed up as I'm going to get it. You can see that it did put out a lot of juice and there's a lot of fat in this juice. So I'm going to have to get rid of that fat because it's best to freeze dry meats without a lot of extra fat because the more fat, um, the more quickly they can go rancid. Now, a lot of people will rinse their, um, you know, ground beef and ground meats like this with hot water or boiling water to get most of the fat off. I've seen some people who will put the meat in a container in a bowl of some sort and put boiling water or boiling broth over it and then refrigerate it overnight so that the fat will rise to the top and harden up on the top, you know, in the morning and then they can just take it off. I don't think I want to go that far because I'm afraid of losing a lot of the flavor of the meat. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drain off this fat and this extra liquid and then I'm going to put it in my strainer and I'm just going to um, run it over it with very hot tap water to rinse off as much fat as I can and hopefully not lose too much flavor. And it looks like our whole sausages are done as well. You can hear those sizzling. And so I'm going to let those cool off a little bit while I drain um, the ground sausage and then I'm going to slice these up into coins. So I've got um, one of my Harvest Right trays here. I'm going to slice up the whole sausages and I'm going to put them on a tray. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my, my tray on my digital scale because you're not supposed to put more than two and a half pounds of food on any given tray. And I don't think I'm in danger of doing that. But just to be sure, I'm just going to put uh, my tray right on my scale and I'm going to zero it out. And now I will be able to tell how much sausage I'm putting on my tray. All right, so now I'm just going to start slicing up my sausages. I did get these a little bit browner than I usually do. I cooked them a little bit longer than usual, but I tasted one and they taste just fine. That's going to be okay. So I'm just going to cut these up into coins. This is like the size that we would use in spaghetti or lazy man lasagna or pasta dishes like that. So it'll be nice to have some sausage that's um, prepared like this so once i get these cut up i think i'm going to rinse these the same way that i did with the ground sausage i'm going to rinse them in some hot water just to get off the extra fat and these are probably going to tend to have a little bit more fat than the ground sausage because it's not going to release um, the way that it did from the ground sausage because these sausages weren't totally ground up but it's okay for most everything that i've read and heard if you have more fat in your meat or whatever it may be, it doesn't have to be meat, um, it may not have as long of a shelf life. It might not last 25 years, but it's probably going to last at least five years. And to me, that's pretty good. If you've got a five-year shelf life on something like this, you could store a five-year supply that you rotate through. And that's a lot of food. I don't think any one of us probably has enough space to store more food than that. So I'm really okay with freeze drying some of these things that have a little bit more fat. I've gathered a lot of experiences from a lot of people that have been doing this a while and people seem to say that they do last several years and I will be testing things as I go along as well. This is a learning experience. I'm going to go ahead and get the rest of these um, sausages sliced up and then I'll bring you back. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get this ground sausage onto the tray. This has been rinsed in hot water and it's drained out pretty well. I've got my tray on my scale and it's all zeroed out. I'm just going to make sure that I'm not adding more than two and a half pounds of food to this tray. It also shouldn't go up too high over the top um, edge of the tray. So I'm just going to put this on and see how much I can get on one tray. Now some people use silicone liners on their trays. Some people line it with parchment paper. We've done the parchment paper um, quite a few times, but I don't think I'm going to have a problem with the sticking. So hopefully I'm not going to regret this later. I don't know if I'm going to get this whole um, three pounds of ground sausage onto this one tray. I'm sure it weighs less than three pounds now because it's been cooked and drained. It would be nice if I did get it all onto one tray because I have quite a few um, other things that I would love to freeze dry at the same time that I'm doing this meat. But we shall see. All right, so I had this measuring in fluid ounces. So now I've set this to um, pounds and ounces. So we're at one pound, 2.3 ounces so far. All right, so weight wise, I'm fine with this tray. It's only at one pound and 14.6 ounces. So if I can get this spread out um, flat enough so that it doesn't stick up too high, then I'm going to be um, good with putting this much uh, meat on one tray. I think that actually looks pretty good. 
So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add my sliced sausage into this same strainer and I'm going to go rinse it in the sink under hot, hot tap water. All right, so I've got another tray and I'm going to go ahead and get this one on the scale as well. And I'm going to fill this up with these rinsed um, sausage coins. All right, now I'm just going to go ahead and arrange these as best I can. I think it's okay if they're not completely... Um, in a flat layer. I just want to make sure if there's any ends that the skin side is down and that they're as spread out as they can be. But we've only got about um, one pound and ten ounces on this tray so this should be all set. All right so I think this is going to be okay. It's not really truly in one single layer but it's as close as I could get it and nothing is really really um completely blocking any other piece. So I think this tray is going to be good to go. So the next thing that I'm going to do on my next tray is going to be green peppers. I got a really good deal on a whole bunch of green peppers and so I thought I would freeze dry some of these. I've washed these and I've cored them and taken out all the seeds and all the pith and all that. So I'm just going to slice these up and get them on my tray. I was kind of torn between doing slices and dices because I use both um, peppers both ways but I'm gonna do slices I thought about doing half the tray sliced and half the tray diced but I thought I should probably just stick with one thing and do the whole tray one way and then I can do diced the next time I do peppers I really hope I don't run into any trouble with these trays sticking. Wow, so I had this whole mess of peppers I thought I would get on this tray. Obviously I overestimated and I think this tray is pretty well full, but that's okay. I can put these in the fridge and we can snack on them and uh, maybe I'll be able to do another run and get those diced. So for my final tray here I'm going to do some mushrooms. Now I've got my mushrooms. I've cleaned them off with a mushroom brush. I've trimmed off the ends. If you don't have a mushroom brush, I've always heard since I was very young that you shouldn't clean mushrooms um, with water because they can absorb a lot of the water. So a mushroom brush or I've also used just a dry paper towel if I don't have a mushroom brush. I've trimmed the ends off. I was going to use an egg slicer to slice these because I've done that before when I was um, using mushrooms, putting mushrooms in my dehydrator. But some of these mushrooms are huge and I honestly don't think that they would fit in the egg slicer. So if I'm going to have to use a knife for some of them, I might as well just use the knife for all of them I figured. But mushrooms um, are one of my absolute favorites freeze dried. Now sometimes we will take, um, sometimes we'll plan to do pizza in our Dutch oven when we're camping and it's a lot easier to take like freeze dried toppings, veggies, um, and meats and things like that than to take all those items fresh when you're going camping and you're living out of a cooler. Um, so actually what we've freeze dried, what I'm freeze drying today is a lot of the items that we usually take when we do um, pizza in our Dutch oven when we're camping. So I could take all of these things I've freeze dried today, the sausage, the mushrooms, the peppers, and they could be some of our toppings for our pizza when we're camping. That's one of the great uses for freeze dried food. It's not just good for, you know, the end of the world and survival situations. It's really good for all sorts of things. We use it in our everyday cooking. You can always have things on hand. I mean, mushrooms go bad so quickly. I've already noticed just from having these for like a day that they've really um, started to deteriorate. So things like this don't stay fresh in your fridge for very long. So having them freeze dried means that you can have them whenever you want. If you open up the fridge and your you know, mushrooms have gone slimy and you needed them for your dinner that night, you can turn to your freeze dried because they're, they're not gonna go slimy on you. So that's one of the reasons that we love freeze dried foods. In addition to the fact that it can last 25 years and it's great for camping and hiking and all of those other reasons. Now I do have a whole nother tub of these mushrooms, so I'm thinking that once I fill this tray, I'm going to get the freeze dryer started and then I might slice up that other tub of mushrooms and put them in the dehydrator. They turn out different in the dehydrator, but I like to use them both. We don't like to put all of our eggs in one basket. You know, we don't just do one thing. We don't just store one thing. Um, we do it all. We do canning. We do dehydrating. We do freeze drying. Um, we store all kinds of foods. We don't, you know, put all of our faith in one thing. Everything has their different strengths and their different weaknesses and their different benefits. And, um, 
you know, they're different uses. They're different places where they can shine. Okay, I think that tray is looking pretty good. I think I've got my four trays ready to go in the machine. All right, so time to get the machine ready. Now, first things first, we do have a fan back here that we aim um, blowing out at the pump. This is our pump right here. And so I'm gonna turn this fan on. That's gonna help keep the pump cool. It's going to run better and it's um, gonna make it last longer as well. Okay, so this is the um, default settings. I'm just going to change the extra dry time. I'm just going to add extra dry time so that whenever this finishes, if we're not here and we're not ready to deal with it, it's going to keep drying. And I found in my experience, most things that we've done need extra dry time anyways. They're not usually finished um, when the machine, you know, senses them to be finished. So I'm going to go ahead and add, I'm going to go ahead and add 18 hours. That's probably um, a little excessive. A lot of people add 10 to 12 hours, but you can always stop it. It's a lot easier to stop it early than it is to add more extra dry time. So sometimes we've added all the way up to the max, which I think is 24 hours. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and save that and start. So this is gonna start to cool down and then in 15 minutes, it's going to prompt us to load the trays. All right, guys, here are my trays all ready to go in. So I've got my ground sausage. This is mild Italian sausage, ground sausage, um, sliced uh, links. And then I've got my green peppers and my mushrooms. And one thing I will say, we have a medium Harvest Right freeze dryer, and that is the most popular size. Most people go with a medium. They have small, medium, large, and they just came out with an extra large, and honestly, I was worried about being able to fill up a large, so we went with a medium, but if I were to do it again, honestly, I'd say I would get the biggest that you can afford to get because the more food you can get in it, like honestly, I had peppers that I didn't wasn't able to fit. I had some extra mushrooms that I didn't get to put in. I did put in all my sausage, and I honestly started this project thinking that I was gonna fill the whole freeze dryer with sausage, so I was kind of impressed that I was able to fit all I had on these two trays. This was started out as about six pounds of sausage. I'm gonna say probably about five and a half pounds went on the trays because um, I did keep some of the links out for myself to eat fresh. And like I said, this was not, it didn't weigh that much once it was cooked and drained. But it started off as six pounds raw weight. But I am super excited for this run. This all looks really great and I can't wait to add this to my food storage. All right, we're ready to roll. So here are our um, ingredients. They are freeze drying in here. Now this is one thing that I do love about the freeze dryer is that I can just put these in. I put these in last night and I just went to sleep and I knew that it would be fine while I was sleeping. So these are in the drying process right now. They're not finished, but they are um, on their way. And then I did end up um, deciding to dehydrate the rest of the mushrooms that I had and then I did a few bell peppers. I sliced up all the rest of the mushrooms that I had and I filled six trays. So what I did was I took those, some of those bell peppers that I had left and I diced them up so that I could dehydrate those. And so these have also been going overnight. Now the crazy thing is I got this set up and I turned it on. I decided to dehydrate these at um, 120 degrees because it seemed like a good medium in between um, what I was reading for the mushrooms which said 110 to 120 and the green peppers which said 125. So I set it to 120 and I just set it to go all night. So both of these processes were really just set it and forget it. I was just able to let them go while we were sleeping. And one nice thing about dehydrating is that I am able to um, adjust the time and temperature while the machine is running pretty easily, which is something that I can't really do with the freeze dryer. I have to get that all set ahead of time and then just let it go. 
Now the funny thing is when I started my dehydrator, I kept thinking that it wasn't working and I was trying to figure out why and then I just realized I just couldn't hear it. It was running and I couldn't hear it because it is a little bit quieter than the freeze dryer. But at this point it's been now about probably about 12 hours that these have been in and you can see that if I pick up a mushroom and I just break it between my fingers it does snap it doesn't bend at all it just snaps cleanly and crisply so that means those are probably done and these green peppers are completely um, shriveled up and dry so I think these are about done as well I did end up using my veggie chopper to do the peppers and this is the size of grid that I chose to use so you can see they do shrink up quite a bit when they dehydrate but I thought that these would be great to throw into Hamburg if I'm frying up some Hamburg to put in some spaghetti or some chop suey or anything like that I thought these little um, bits of pepper would be great because I would often put diced pepper in something like that and if I don't have any fresh peppers um, I can use these little dehydrated bits and they should rehydrate right in the dish I would not rehydrate these first I would just throw them right in We always test all of our food before we finalize the cycle. Some foods just take longer and it can be difficult to tell with just sight and touch if they're actually done. Our favorite tool for this is our thermal imaging camera. Any cool spots mean it's not fully dry. You can also weigh your trays at two hour intervals until they've stopped losing any weight at all and that's another sign that they're done. We also have a moisture meter but they're not really meant for this task and they have their limitations. But sometimes a combination of several of these methods is the best way to be really sure if your food is dry. And when in doubt, it's best to let it go a little longer because you can't over dry your freeze dried food. But if you let any moisture remain, it can ruin your whole batch. These foods did really well though and they dried relatively quickly and evenly compared to some foods that we've done. So you can see here everything is done and I find it remarkable how similar everything looks when it's finished to how it looked when it went in. These things don't change very much except these are completely light and if you see I can just snap that in my fingers and same with the mushrooms. It's all um, completely dry. So I'm just gonna let this come to room temperature. It's a little bit warm from being taken out of the freeze dryer. And I'm just gonna let it come to room temperature and as, and as soon as it does, then I'm gonna package it up. I don't wanna package it up while it's warm because I'm afraid of having condensation issues. But by the same token, I also don't wanna wait too long because this can start reabsorbing moisture from the air in the room. So I wanna get this packaged up airtight as quickly as I can. Now I just thought it would be kind of cool to show you the difference because I did freeze dry these and then with the mushrooms and peppers that I had left I did um, run a dehydrator full. And you can kind of see the difference. The mushrooms don't look too much different. Mushrooms are actually one of my favorite things to dehydrate because I like the way that they come out dehydrated. The peppers, these were not sliced, these were diced into small dices. And this here was the size of the dicing blade that I used so it was my smaller dicing blade so I want to say these are probably quarter inch dices but this is how they come out they came out um, you can kind of see now in comparison these uh, freeze dried ones look the same they didn't shrivel up so if I had done dices in the in the freeze dryer they would have come out looking exactly like they went in basically but peppers and mushrooms are actually two of my favorite things to dehydrate. Um, it's just a different process. Um, you can use them a little bit differently. But of all the things that I can dehydrate, I feel like these tend to come out the best. But I just thought this was interesting because I did do um, both of these. I haven't run my dehydrator since we got the freeze dryer. So this is the first time that I've done a comparison like this um, back to back. Now I know that I did, I did a video on the difference between freeze dried and dehydrated foods and I did show you some examples of some freeze dried and some dehydrated and how they're different and how they're the same and this is just another um, example of that. I will link that video down in the description box in case you're interested in learning a little bit more about both processes. Okay guys now we've got all this food ready for the pantry shelves. I ended up with now these are half gallon jars so I ended up with about three quarters of the half gallon jar of the sausage crumbles. Um, I only got about half of this well this was a little bit more full this has been a victim of a lot of snacking along the way as it was being put away and 
everybody wanted to try it. Um, and I did leave a couple of these links out fresh. I didn't freeze dry them so that I could have them for lunches. But so I ended up with a little bit more than a quart of the sausage slices. I also got um, almost a full half gallon jar of these green peppers. And same with the mushrooms. So that's about one tray full. So one tray just about fills a half gallon jar. And then with the stuff that I dehydrated, I got a full jar of the mushrooms. And I don't know if you can see this, but I got almost a full, this is a little uh, quarter pint jar. It's about a half a cup of these dehydrated um, diced green peppers. It's not gonna be taking up any space in my freezer. The meat is all cooked and ready to go. If I need it, I don't have to thaw it out and cook it. That's already been done, which is such a time saver as well. That also makes them perfect for snacking on. I like just snacking on these foods dry as well as using them in my cooking. And these freeze dried foods, as long as we store them properly, can last 25 years. And they're gonna be just as nutritious and just as tasty as the day I put them up. Now I put these right into these mason jars. I find these are very good for airtight storage. I pretty much keep all of my dehydrated foods in the mason jars all the time, but for the freeze dried ones, if I decide to put those up for long term, I will probably put them into mylar bags and add up oxygen absorbers. The mylar bags have the added bonus of protecting the food inside from light, which the mason jars don't, and that is important. Of course, the mylar bags need to be protected from rodents because they can chew through it. So each method of storage has its pros and its cons, but both are acceptable ways to store your freeze dried food and really all of your dry goods for the long term. If you are interested in getting a home freeze dryer and freeze drying your own food at home, the freeze dry that we have that you saw me use today is a Harvest Right Medium. We will have links um, right down below to the machines that I use today. And for the month of May, Harvest Right has a special going on. They've got up to $500 off of their freeze dryers this month. I think it's $500 off the large and the medium and maybe $200 off the small. But this is like their spring version of their Black Friday sale. So it's just like Black Friday. It's going to be the best time to buy a home freeze dryer if it's something that's been on your radar, something that you've been thinking about getting. Now's a great time. And I'll tell you, they are definitely a game changer. If you don't know much about freeze drying and you don't know all the benefits it offers, why freeze dried foods are so important to include in your pantry, definitely check out the video that I made talking about freeze drying and why it's such a great way to preserve your food. It's really a great tool to have in your arsenal. We have a lot more videos to bring you with different things that we're freeze drying and how we're using them. Of course, if you don't have a freeze dryer, we also do lots of other food preservation here, dehydrating and canning, lots of canning. So do make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you can catch all of our videos. Leave us a thumbs up while you're down there if you enjoyed this video. And if you made it all the way to the end of the video, leave me a bell pepper emoji down in the comments. And I'll leave that video about freeze drying right up here for you to check out next. I'm Jarrah with Wicked Prepared. Survive today, thrive tomorrow. We'll see you next time.